Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to start by trying to pronounce a Gaelic greeting. Kayed <laughs> Mila Falcha. As a sponsored ministry of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, who were founded in Dublin, Ireland, and on behalf of the staff of the Mercy Conference and Retreat Center, I use this Gaelic greeting to extend 100,000 welcomes to each of you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sister Jan Hayes, the Director of Development here at the Mercy Conference and Retreat Center. I'm delighted that you've joined us either in person or online to listen to our internationally noted sculptor and longtime Mercy friend, Don Wiegand. I've been meeting with Don for several months now in preparation for this afternoon's presentation, and I know we are in for a very special experience. I'm grateful for his generosity. And I thank you for attending this event, not only for your own inspiration and enjoyment, but to support the good work that takes place in this ministry every day. We are indebted to our friends and donors who helped to make this ministry possible. So a heartfelt thank you in Gaelic, go, go Rama Agat. So are you impressed? Those are the only two Gaelic expressions that I know. Thank you. YouTube is wonderful. Okay, and now to tell you more about our mission and the good work that takes place here every day, I'll turn the mic over to our executive director, Dawn Stringfield. Good afternoon. I want to echo Sister Jan's welcome to you. It is so good to have you here with us, and I know that this will be a blessed time. At Mercy Conference and Retreat Center, we are impelled by the gospel to offer hospitality and healing in the mercy tradition. As you walk through our chapel to this space, the works of mercy you were encircled by, and they guide this ministry. Hospitality, healing, and the works of mercy come in many forms in this building and on these grounds. We're home to local parishes, churches, and faith communities who come for retreats like ACTS and RCIA. Religious women and men, priests and deacons come regularly for annual retreats, formation and ordination, assemblies and chapters. We also offer a quiet space for reflection and formation for nonprofits, health systems, schools and universities. We even hold the space for the creative spirit with composers, quilters, crafters, and visual artists like our friend Don. In addition to hosting a diverse mix of groups, we support the spiritual journey of women and men through meaningful programs, spiritual companioning, quiet time for personal or directed retreats, and respite days for individuals, especially those on the front line in hospitals and clinics. Whatever the need may be, a deepening relationship with the divine, spiritual nourishment for the journey, solace during grieving, strength for healing, or peace in the midst of life's challenges, people find their way to mercy here. Now I know you have come to Mercy Center to see and hear Don share about his work. Our hope is that this will be the first of many times that you will find Mercy Conference and Retreat Center a welcoming environment. There is information at your place setting about hosting a group and the opportunity to sign up for information about our programs and spiritual opportunities. There's also a donation envelope if you find yourself inspired to make a gift so that we can continue to be a place of hospitality and healing in the Mercy tradition for many years to come. Again, I really want to thank you all for being here. And now I'd like to turn the mic back over to Sister Jan to talk more about today's event. This really is high tech. We're trying to video a documentary as well as doing recording of this meeting, so it's quite involved. So why this event? Why are we having this event? MCRC has a long history of visual and performing arts to create an environment that can lead to healing and an experience of the sacred in the many examples that Dawn just cited. The belief that the arts can promote spirituality and healing is a long established tradition dating back to our tribal ancestors and indigenous peoples, as well as in the Catholic Church, 
other religious traditions, psychology, medicine, rehabilitation sciences, spirituality, and theology. Because we believe in the transformative power of the arts, our building and grounds at MCRC are filled with works of art in stained glass, watercolor, oil paintings, marble, wood, and ceramic sculptures, textiles, and other media. In our nearly 50 years of existence, MCRC has offered retreats, meditation experiences, and performances featuring pottery and painting, poetry, sacred music, the Liturgical Composers Concert, Healing Music with Amy Cammy, Concerts with Carrie Newcomer, and numerous other artists and MCRC friends, all for the purpose of providing enjoyment, inspiration, self-reflection, and healing, which is God's desire for each of us. However, this may be the first time that we have focused exclusively on sculpture as a visual art that can lead the viewer to inspiration and reflection in both our civic and spiritual lives. We are honored to have Don Wiegand, an internationally noted St. Louis sculptor and longtime Mercy friend, to guide us through his own career as a sculptor, to share stories about the experiences and people who encouraged and inspired him, to pursue this artistic path and his deeply rooted philosophy that our gifts should be used to serve others. So the flow of this afternoon. This afternoon's presentation will first feature Don presenting an overview of the decades of his life and career as a sculptor. He'll accompany his remarks with slides of his creations, as well as examples of sculptures and derivatives that he has brought with him. Don will also tell the story of the Wiegand Foundation, creating art to memorialize significant accomplishments in science, technology, national defense, and human service. Of course, there will be stories about some of the leaders and celebrities that Don has met along the way. Some of them are very touching, and some of them are just plain funny. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for a Q&A with the audience. So if you've ever wanted to know about the process of producing a bronze sculpture, here's your chance. You can ask. You have probably also noticed that we are wearing several microphones. That's why Dawn and I are doing this dance with the microphones up here, and that there are multiple cameras in the auditorium. In addition to our own recording of this event, Chuck Schmidt, uh, a documentary filmmaker is incorporating parts of this experience into a documentary film he is producing about Don. So this is a multimedia experience, folks. Here we are. And uh, for those of you who are interested, what you were seeing at the beginning as you walked in was we were, didn't have the audio on. This is the, the footage that uh, Chuck has already shot for the documentary. So those of you who would like to stay after we're finished and see it and hear the audio, we'll play it for you so you can see it. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Don, now that we've set the stage. As I looked over our guest list, I became aware that many of us know Don from different chapters in our lives. Bill Brandis knew Don as a childhood friend. Sister Corlita was one of Don's art teachers at Mercy High School in University City. Sister Lalamont was teaching at Mercy High when Don was a student there. Sister Victoria was his high school classmate. A number of you have met Don in art circles here in St. Louis. I have met Don because he is a longtime friend of the Sisters of Mercy, and many of you have read about Don as the local and national media covered his career as a sculptor. And some of you are meeting him for the first time. However we know Don, I think we would all agree that this is a talented and dedicated artist who is passionate about his craft and practices it well. He has a deeply rooted service ethic and credits his faith as the taproot and inspiration for everything that he does. In his stunning, sympathetic, and heroic images, Don sees the face of God coming to life at his fingertips in clay, bronze, stainless steel, and live casts. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our mercy friend, Don Wiegand. Sister Jan, thank you. Dawn, Carolyn, back there, wherever you are, everyone that's helped so much to make this uh, work today, that we could share the experiences that I've gone through. And uh, we all go through experiences in life, you know, uh, how we grow up, who taught us, our parents, our faith, 
is really a big part of it. Um, so today what I'm going to do is talk about um, my process and some of my early days when I was first thinking of art. But first, what I think I should do is, it's very important, this is a part ceremony. Um, this is Sister Huberta's bell. Sister gave me this, it's from Mercy. Spare the, spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> this is for you, sister, just in case oh, you need to discipline or oh, keep okay. me under control. Okay. Oh. I'll try to behave, everybody, I promise. <laughs> we have some great stories that, that I'd love to share, but this is really just a touch of our work. And I thought the best thing I could do is start back uh, when I was about four years old. Uh, I grew up in my uh, grandparents' house in North St. Louis until I was five on Durant Avenue <coughs> with my family. And let's show the first slide, 1950s. This is the backyard of my grandfather's house that he built. My mom helped him. Uh, that's my brother, George, on the left, my mom holding Janie, my sister Jane. I'm in the middle, and then my sister Mary Claire on the right. Um, by the way, if you familiar with my sister Jane, she's Smokehouse Market and Annie Guns. That's a great place. But I'm holding something. Can you show the next slide? It's a close-up. This might sound crazy, but as a kid I saw my father taking a photograph of my mom, and he took the negative somewhere to a printer and had it enlarged. And I thought, hmm, this is intriguing. I think I want to start recording things that I like. Well, right here, I'm holding a lollipop, okay. Uh, next slide, please. This is Sister Mary Eucaria, mom's niece with my brother, George. And again, I'm holding something. I started holding items every time a photograph was taken of me. Uh, I think this is Gumby. Uh, uh, the close-up next. Uh, sorry, it's not a great photo. It's 19, uh, 1950, 51. Um, because I kept thinking, I want to enlarge this. I wanted to somehow keep this because it, it meant something to me. I'm not sure what Gumby meant to me, but I liked the shape. And the fun, kind of fun because it bent. I didn't, it almost felt a little bit like clay. Um, Mom and Dad gave me it back then when we were kids. Do you remember having punch-out sets? They were kind of heavy cardboard books that had uh, pictures that were serrated along the edge of the picture. So we didn't have to use scissors as kids. We'd punch them out. So I fell in love with the nativity set. So I, I was looking for those photographs, but I have all these photographs of me holding baby Jesus, Joseph, Mary, the shepherds, because I wanted to enlarge them someday. I'm going to talk a little bit about more of that a little bit later. Let's, let's, this, by the way, this is a Durant, that was Durant Avenue in North St. Louis. We moved out to Chesterfield uh, when I was five. Let's start the next, okay. So I was studying, uh, I was doing some art at Ascension School in Chesterfield with uh, the Sisters of the Precious Blood. And they did some encouraging for me. But um, I was five when my dad came and said, Don, remember that store we went to out in Chesterfield uh, a couple weeks ago? I said, yeah. We're buying into it. We're moving there. So Pop grabbed us all. We moved out to Chesterfield, moved on top of the store. And this was about 1952, and Pop named it the Smokehouse Market. Uh, I took the third floor at the time when I was in grade school and started turning that into my art, my art studio. So graduated in 1962, and Father Godfrey actually got me to go into Mercy Mercy High School. We started the long trip, and that was a really wonderful period of my time in my life. I really have to say that as I talk about the work, the influence of the Sisters of Mercy are really showing through this whole project, and I hope you'll see it, and I'll even point it out. Um, this is about 1964, and this is a tempera painting that uh, a very, very special lady taught me how to do. Sister Mary Carlita. 
This was her class at Mercy. And um, we had a lot of fun together, but you really inspired me. Um, I'll never forget working on this piece, and you liked it. I know you had it for a, for a long time hanging in your office. The, um, another person, another sister there, uh, it, uh, Mercy, was Sister Mary Legis. But backing up for one more moment, it's interesting because Sister Carlita, and I've mentioned this before, uh, back, I think it was a sophomore, when she saw me sketching, and by the way, I brought a couple of my original sketches over there, uh, she said, Don, you draw like a sculptor. I had no idea that that was about to happen. But isn't that perceptive? I think that's so amazing. She put a seed into my head, even though I loved, I loved making things. So, moving on next. My largest sculpture, the studio. I, I learned that, interesting from all angles, and I was really one with nature, I loved plants and animals, and they just love making things. Um, so I started this, I was a junior at, at Mercy High School, 1965, when I went to my dad and asked if I could save the slaughterhouse, because it was going to get torn down. The Andy Kroger slaughterhouse was built in 1926. Um, it was quite a project, so my, my buddies Tim Johnson and, and Mark Weedman and Jim Kellenbrink from Mercy, we got together, raised the roof, saved the slaughterhouse, and then I started expanding around it. But I was treating it as a sculpture. Sister Mary Legis, Mechanical Drawing, Mercy High School. She taught me so much about shape and drawing and thinking three-dimensionally. Um, God bless Sister Legis. Later on, we actually copyrighted the building. So I have three federal copyrights on the structure. If you look at the back windows, if you start to look at the windows, that's one copyright. It's actually 90 feet long, and it's a, it's a, it's a sculpture. Uh, Modrian, I love Modrian's work. So it's a, it's a series of uh, square rectangles that fit together for the window. That's one copyright. The entire building is copyrighted, and the front room floor is a mosaic, which I built when I was 17. I was just got out of Mercy uh, School. Uh, but I had to say, we copyrighted all these later on, and it's interesting because when Sister Carlita uh, had left Mercy back and forth a few times, this was in the early 70s, she wrote me a letter and started talking about, how's the studio coming? Well, in order to prove authorship, I needed something that went back to the 60s and 70s with the Library of Congress in Washington to talk about, and that letter actually dated the period that I'm the author of that building. Isn't that fun? So your letter's in the Library of Congress. Where's the letter done? Well, I have the original. I made a copy for, they have that in, in, in Washington. I don't trust them to have the original. I've got that. <laughs> Sorry, Lloyd. <laughs> okay, here we are. Gra graduating class 1966. I'd already started on the studio, but after, Washington, after Mercy, I went to Washington University and started studying sculpture. I was inspired by a, a professor there, Dick Doomey, who started teaching me three-dimensional shape beyond what I even knew, which I was wonderful. Uh, let's go next. So I started building these ceramic constructions because I love abstraction. Uh, I really had learned and still learned that, <clears throat> you know, freeform, abstraction, realism, whatever we want to call it, you're dealing with shape and space. To me, it's all the same. I see our bodies as the most beautiful abstraction and reality too. And nature around us is real and it's the most beautiful abstraction because it's so real, it's so sculptural. I mean, it's alive. So I started building these constructions and I think Sister Allegis inspired me on the, how I was just building these structures. Uh, let's go on again. There's a larger one there. I actually, I, that's, that's actually in a collection in Maui in Hawaii. Uh, that one's about four foot tall. It was a bigger piece. They're all fired ceramic. Uh, okay. This is a piece that I, I was in Mr. Schleppi's class at Washu, and I was doing a design out of black walnut. I call it Madonna. Uh, it's about four foot. I brought the small maquette that we did later on over there, but it's really, as I was sculpting, I really felt Madonna, mother and child. Uh, okay. This is a rough sketch portrait I was doing at Washu. I loved doing capturing life. And this was a, a sketch where you only have maybe 
uh, three classes, three hours each, to do a quick, fresh sketch. This is, this is a piece I called Arthur. He was a model at WashU. Okay, this is another one of those, Rene. Uh, quick, early pieces in my life. Um, so this is uh, in, the, in the 1960s. Boy, that was, WashU was the place to be in the 60s. I mean, wow. <laughs> I was down in the art school, and we didn't pay much attention. It was going up on the hill, but there was some stuff going on up there. Uh, okay. Uh, 1970s. This is, again, now this, this is the studio much later on, obviously. Uh, there's so many photographs and slides I could show you guys today, but I'm trying to keep this within somewhat of a re re realism. Okay, next. Um, these are two portraits I did. Janice and Judy, they were private commission. These are resin. Next, please. John Fabick, um, between bo both Janice and Judy's portraits and this, uh, my brother and my cousin were in the kitchen because I'd already built most of the studio, and there was a fire Christmas Eve, 1971. It devastated me, but you know, that's what life's about. Uh, how do we get up from trials? I have to say, I actually learned how to antique wood through that because we started scraping all the wood and it showed how beautiful it was. I use that on a lot of my bases for my sculptures now. I don't recommend the technique though, but you know, <laughs> let's start a four alarm fire in your house and <laughs> learn how to antique wood. <laughs> Not. <laughs> John Fabick, uh, Elaine commissioned me in the John Fabick Tractor Company which for a few years there when the fire happened, I, I quit sculpting for just a couple of years as I was rebuilding the studio. Um, and I was always trying to take the positive side of it because I thought after the fire, oh, maybe I'll get to do some things now with the building I didn't get to do before. So you always have to kind of think, if I get from point A to B, if I can get, go through this strategy and accept that I can do something better to get to point B, I think that's a good philosophy that I learned at Mercy. And it's really in life, you know, and it's true. I thought, okay, I'm going to take advantage of this terrible moment and learn how to get this over here, and I did. I actually expanded the studio on something that I wanted to do that I didn't get to do before. Cool. John was one of my first commissions to come back, and he became very instrumental in my life. He and, he and Elaine Fabic, he posed for me in the studio. This is a piece I was commissioned in Fort Valley, Georgia. It's a great story. Um, it's for a tombstone there in Fort Valley in Macon County. Uh, it's, it's, in a, it's a doctor's memorial, Dr. Larimore. He, he was out of Georgia, worked out of St. Louis. His, uh, his wife, Ruth, uh, commissioned me to do this. This, is, this weighs about 600 pounds. It's about this tall. And it's, it's based on a quote from Milton about uh, the mind and balance. So once again, it's a shape. Um, it was fun working with Ruth. Okay, next again. Cora was a commission that you may be familiar with. There's a life size at the Missouri Botanical Garden, and then there's another life size at the Memphis Botanical Garden, and in some private collections. But she, she was a young girl that I was picked to sculpt, honoring someone, a different person who was killed on a bike, Connie Hume, which are really amazing stories how we did the Cora. Uh, she was, Cora is a real person, she's, a, she's still here with us in her 40s, but in 1979, she was uh, about three going on four. The only way I could get her to look and pose like that is I took a television, tied it on the ceiling, <laughs> and every at three o'clock, we watched Mr. Rogers. <laughs> she, I, I could, it's like the television, you know how it mesmerizes? She was like this, I could do this, and she's this, you know. <laughs> Her mom was right there watching, but she'd just stand there like this and I could move her arms and do whatever, you know. She was locked out. <laughs> uh, next, please. This is the piece at the Missouri Botanical Garden that we dedicated many years later. This is life size of, of Cora. Some, again, some great stories here, but uh, let's go to, uh, this was a private commission when uh, a, a young lady commissioned me and said, I just want you to do a piece on Dr. King. Uh, it, was, it was a moment about 1980. And um, from photographs, I just did a little study. It's a little portrait study about this big in the round. Okay, next. Uh, between that and this, there's a really fun 
interesting thought. I, um, I called my, you know, sculpture art is hard to sustain yourself, especially in the early days, and to this day I'm still not sure how we're surviving, but we're mentioning our way through. The, uh, it was about 1981 when, uh, it was a spring, when I was thinking, I wanted to become a first responder. I really kind of wanted to join the fire department. My friend Chip Bealey was chief. Uh, his father, Otto, had, Otz had started the Chesterfield Fire Department. So I called Chip and started talking about it because I realized, oh, there's days on, there's days off. I could keep sculpting. There's some sustenance there with some stability. I started driving towards, because I had a meeting with Chip, and um, I was driving on the outer road uh, in Chesterfield, and something, just for a minute, I thought, you know, I'm going to wait a couple days. I said a prayer. I thought, I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this, I'm ready. I want to serve. I kind of thought this would work. But I was led to go back down to the Golden Cup restaurant, which was a little greasy spoon that we all hung out in gumbo, which I love. the great eggs, uh, bacon and eggs. I walked in, and my friend Bob Leibachie was sitting there, who was a friend of mine and a carpenter, said, I want you to meet two people. He introduced me to, to a couple named Jack and Debbie Shaw. I sat down with them. They came to the studio. The next day, Jack called me and said, Don, we want to commission you to do something. We met again the next day, and believe it or not, through a conversation, Jack commissioned me to start a limited edition. I'm Ricky Olsenberg. That happened within three days of that. And I thought to myself, hmm, you're not supposed to do this. So we started doing this, and this led to so many things. But first, I'd like to say one thing, you know, looking at everyone in the audience, and everything in my life is teamwork, 100%. This is not just me. I have so many different people that work with me through these years, including the inspiration the sisters and brothers have given me, my parents, my friends. But I'd like, I would like to recognize the real hero in the audience, Tony Sandler. Yeah. Chief Bill Brandis, Street Corps. So really, those soft sandy workers were medical and chief of the fire department, the whole department of Street Corps. Thank you, Bill. We all took You could have met a fine firefighter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really serious about that. Yeah, I don't want to start. I thought this is. I wanted to do it, but somehow I thought, well, I guess I'm supposed to do this. This led to so many things, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's do the next slide. I thought, you know, at this point, if I ever got anything to Smithsonian, this is 1983. Um, I had met Mrs. Lindbergh in 82, right before this. This is the Smithsonian with Walter Boyne and Dave Martin Lindbergh, same as the uh, next. We walked across the street, and Lenny Briggs, director of the airport, Don Reynolds, Missouri Airport Authority, Elizabeth Dole, Department of Transportation, we unveiled the bronze there. Got back on the plane and had a special dinner with you all. It's like, look, look at my face, I'm kind of like. <laughs> in my serious suit. <laughs> This was another amazing moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, how art takes us to these paths. It's just like, this is 1984. And Jim Newton unveiling my piece. Jim was one of the famous uh, friends of the, the, the Uncommon Friends. There's a movie out on that with Thomas Edison, Hen, uh, Henry Ford. That's Jim Newton, okay? Now, right before this, Alan Shepard walked up to the microphone with John Glenn and said, we want to put Don's sculpture in space to commemorate not just Don's work, but what Lindbergh has done to put mankind into space. And I know there's a lot of controversial talk about this man, Charles Lindbergh, but I sculpted him not because of his faults. I sculpted him because of, he had this vision to do that mission. Matter of fact, I think if I waited to sculpt people that never had a problem or never sinned, I can only sculpt the good Lord himself because we're all in need of help. So right after that, I almost passed out. 
when I heard John Glenn and let me do that. Look at my face. You know what I'm doing? I'm looking at the ground, thinking of cornfields and gumbo, and what can I do to feed my chickens? I had to get out of the moment because I was scared to death. I thought I was going to knock Mrs. Lindbergh off the stage. <laughs> Next, please. I got over it. I survived. And that's Ann Morrow Lindbergh. What an amazing woman. I mean, just, I admired her so much. Uh, I didn't become good friends with her. I'd met her many times when we unveiled my pieces, but I've become very close to the family. Um, and look at, look at the Mercury 7. It's just unbelievable. They were all very gracious to me. Uh, okay. Then, not to do any thing less, but originally when I sculpted the piece, I thought my portrait, because it was a limited edition, and they would be located all around the world, touching where Charles had landed and touched how many lives. This is Labergé, Paris with General Litherog, director of the Labergé airport where Charles landed, unveiling my stainless in Paris that same year. That's uh, Wendy Lindbergh. Uh, uh, Eric and Morgan's sister. Um, what a moment. It's like, wow. Okay. Of course, we had to give the ladies recognition here. <laughs> After the Charles Lindbergh, Nikki Kaplan, the, the famous hot air balloonist, who was really another very special person who I sculpted later on, said, Don, you have to sculpt Amelia Earhart. Come on. This is my little portrait study of, Lynn, of Amelia. Uh, next. Again, 99 headquarters, Oklahoma City, Will Rogers Airport, unveiling the first stainless. Nikki Kaplan is to the right of the sculpture, and to the left is Muriel Earhart Morrissey, Amelia's sister. We presented Amelia's sister with the first bronze that she took back to Bedford, Massachusetts, and that's the first stainless cast honoring that that group right there. Jack Shar is all the, all the way to the left. Next to him in the back row is Adele Shar. Adele was one of the original 99s, but she was one of the flyers in World War II, ladies that flew the planes. And back then, as sick as this is, if you were a woman pilot. You couldn't have passengers. So they were just shuttling the planes back and forth in World War II. That changed, ladies. But Adele Shar, what an amazing lady. And Debbie Shar is back there. I'm kind of stuck in the middle, in the back. I wasn't drinking, I was just <laughs> happy. <laughs> Next. Al Cervantes posed for me in the early 80s. Uh, this is at the uh, convention center downtown. That's a stainless steel cast. Uh, okay, next. Right about that time, um, Father Reiner at St. Louis University and Monsignor Wilkerson, my cousin, worked out a deal that I was gonna sculpt Gussie Bush for St. Louis University to thank uh, the Bushes for what they had done for St. Louis University. This is Gussie posing in the studio about 1982. And I'm working on the French play piece. Um, he was well behaved, you know. When you're sculpting somebody, they're on good behavior. <laughs> Although there's some really fun stories with that. Um, I asked Mr. Bush if, if I could do a life casting off his hand because that would save time. This is one of the first life castings I did. Uh, we could pass it around if you want, but... This is an interesting story because Mr. Bush in, 80, in 1982 was 82 years old and he had to use the restroom pretty often. So I said, Mr. Bush, you better go use, the, do what you got to do because this is going to take about 45 minutes because back then I was using plaster. So I had Gussie sitting there with his hands on the cane, the Rams cane that his, his uh, distributor, Arthur Pepin, gave him from Tampa. And I put the plaster on his hands, but before you do that back then, uh, you would always grease the hands really down with Vaseline so the hair didn't stick, okay? Well, the poor man was sitting there, and all of a sudden, after about 10 minutes, he started squirming a little bit. I said, Don, I, I think I've got to use the restroom. He was a little harsher than that, but... <laughs> after about 20 minutes, he says, Don, I've really got to do something here. I said, Mr. Bush, hold on a little bit longer. <laughs> 
Next thing, it was about 30 minutes later when he said, Don, I gotta go. <laughs> So I, start, I started trying to pull the cast off his hands. Ladies and gentlemen, he wiggled so much it was stuck. So what did I have to do? At that time in the studio, I had a sink over here. I had to go take Gussie Bush, put his hands under the sink and run warm water over his hands. That doesn't exactly help the situation. He looks at me in his gruffy voice, pull the thing off. So I went, <laughs> we have a lot of bush DNA here. I took half the hair off his hand. I showed that to the family a couple times and they're kind of... <laughs> Our technique of life casting has improved drastically, everyone. <laughs> we use alginate now and, and I have to say we, we, we haven't lost any fingers since anymore, okay? Uh, next. By the way, we unveiled this piece in stainless at Stainless University in 1984. It was an amazing moment in Bush Center. That's stainless steel with Gussie Bush, life size. Right after this piece, uh, Jack and I decided to do Mark Twain. We were flying back from Paris after we unveiled the Lindbergh piece there, and Ray Pigeny was director of the Missouri Historical Society. He said, Don, you have to honor Missouri and do Samuel Clemens. So I went to mow his found this photograph of him riding in bed, 1895, Puddinhead Wilson. So from notebook, I transformed his actual first lines of his notebook there on the tablet, and I created uh, Samuel writing that Puddinhead Wilson, 1895. It's a limited edition, there are a number of casts around. Next. Of course, we had to take one to the president. This is Michael Fagan and uh, Henry Sweets next to him. Jack Danforth, Jack Shaw, and Jack's uh, daughter, along with Mike Watunsky, McDonald Aircraft. When we presented uh, the president the um, first bronze, or one of the bronzes, and I gave him the first tree frog. Because when I was sculpting the sculpture in a water-based clay, a Missouri tree frog started living on the sculpture. Really wild. Now, I don't believe personally in reincarnation, but I kept talking to this little frog like, is it Samuel? Is, are you coming back, jumping frog of Calaveras County? <laughs> <laughs> so I handed the president the first tree frog, and he looked at me and said, I got a story for you. So all of a sudden, President Reagan, by the way, I'm standing next to him, and if you notice one thing about my face, Look at the color of everybody else's face. I'm purple. I was scared to death. I'm sitting there thinking, where am I? How did I get here? I'm scared. I turned around and I was going to sit down and I thought, I can't sit down. So that's when I started talking and handed the tree frog. And I kind of started to get better, but he started talking about this story, which was great. He said, Mark, Don, you probably haven't heard this one, but Mark Twain was on shipboard one time. And he went to the galley, he was sitting there, he was about to have breakfast or lunch or something, and someone came in and realized who he was and sat down with him. And this guy who sat with him thought, I'm gonna, I got something I'm gonna impress Mark Twain with. So he looks at, looks at Samuel and said, uh, sir, did you know that sugar is the only word in the English language that has the sh sound? And Twain looked at him and said, are you sure? <laughs> That's a Reagan joke. <laughs> After Mark Twain, we had to sculpt Ernest Hemingway. This is another limited edition. Uh, my friend Michael Fagan set this up. My dear friend Michael knew the Hemingways. Jack Hemingway, the oldest son, and Patrick, we worked with them directly of the three sons. Three sons. And they asked me to depict their father, 1940, typing for whom the bell tolls. It was a more a happier time in his life without the beard. So that was the subject. Uh, next. Amazingly enough, that's Jack Hemingway, Pat, uh, Ernest's oldest son. And this is the Kennedy Library in Boston. Mary Kennedy and Jackie O uh, knew that John Kennedy loved uh, Ernest Hemingway. 
So in the archive room on the third floor of the Kennedy Library where all of Hemingway's original manuscripts are, my first cast of Ernest sits. That was an amazing, another amazing moment. I mean, it's like, once again, I'm thinking, how did I get here? <laughs> this is really wild. And actually, Jack and uh, we went drinking afterwards. He tells some great stories, especially when he gets a bourbon. <laughs> he always said he's between uh, his famous two daughters and his famous father. He wasn't sure where he was because he was Margot and Marl's father. Uh, next. We had the first one with President Reagan, George Bush, 1989. Uh, the state of Idaho was Senator McClure and Jack Hemingway presented the president in the Oval Office the first, uh, another cast, an artist's proof of the Ernest Hemingway piece. It, it, if you notice, they keep changing the plates. <laughs> Obviously, the president has their own plates. Um, another just amazing moment, and the Bushes became kind of good friends on other projects. Okay. Uh, Mel Fisher, Michael introduced me to Gene Lyons, who worked for National Geographic, who introduced me to Mel Fisher. I sculpted Mel, the treasure hunter of the Atocha and the Santa Margarita, the famous. He found it after 16 years of looking in the mother load. I started the piece before he found the mother load um, with some of his gold chains around his neck. These, these casts are up and down Florida and Key West and Sebastian, Florida. Okay. We started doing some pieces honoring the Olympics through Fine Art Limited and Jack. Uh, obviously, I, I was studying with some of the famous gymnasts or noted people that were helping me get this balance right on the balance beam. Okay. Hockey. We scored the hockey piece. Um, I used uh, onyx from so the, the Baja, which is pure. It's really quite special onyx uh, for the bases. And... Um, this was kind of fun because in 1991, uh, we had the All-Star Game in the arena here, and uh, Bruce Affleck called us and asked if we could provide a piece for one of the winners. So Chrysler was sponsoring the event for the 99 All-Star. We took one of our casts and put a stars on it and made a special artist proof cast. So um, Chrysler gave it a, a, a truck, his first, we were second prize, okay? So, uh, Lemieux won first prize, and Matt Naslin won second prize, our sculpture. And I'll never forget this. Bruce said they were arguing in the locker room in French because they both wanted the, the sculpture. Neither one of them wanted the truck. <laughs> <laughs> but Matt took his piece to Canada. <laughs> okay. Uh, women's single layback ice skating. Um, actually, on this piece, when you put it on a, a, a turntable and spin it, she's doing the correct turn. Okay. Track and field for the 88 Olympics and downhill slalom. Okay. After the, the end of the, close to the end of the uh, 80s, we were preparing for obviously the 100th anniversary, which was uh, 1886, of our famous wonderful Statue of Liberty. Frederick Augusta Bartholdi. So I'm sculpting a sculpture of a sculpting, let's see, I'm sculpting a sculpture of a sculptor sculpting. <laughs> so our first cast of that is in New York in Ellis Island, um, in the Bob Hope Reading Room, actually, on Ellis Island. Okay. Uh, oh, the other one, too, we actually did a, a bar relief of that piece the same piece, and that's uh, the Statue of Liberty Club presented that in uh, Comar, France, so that hangs in Bartholdi's museum. And we have a medal of that I can show you guys a little later. I did the German bar relief for Ellis Island. That's my partner Jack and my nephew Patrick that posed for me, so uh, that's, that's freedom and liberty, I believe, Chuck, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. A piece in light 1988. Uh, Dan Brennan, mercy, mercy here. Um, the first cast of this is one of the first bronzes is actually here in the Mercy uh, Hospital uh, Medical Library. And there's another cast at St. Louis University Medical Library. Dan was actually working on a little diploma on me. So he's actually sculpting on me and I'm sculpting him. And he actually removed the diploma when I delivered the sculpture, so it's accurate. And by the way, at that point, the mask could be dropped because he was taking the stitches out. 
Another thing I've tried to do is be historically accurate when we're capturing somebody. We're actually capturing a moment of time beyond their life on what they're doing and what they stood for. Okay. The 90s. Okay. The Cardinals called me and wanted to enlarge my piece that we did at St. Louis Shoe for Bush Stadium. You guys may see that once in a while at Gate 2 now. Um, it's heroic size. Sculpture uh, is life size, heroic size, and then things like the Statue of Liberty would be called monumental. So um, I'm going to show you a few things a little bit later on enlarging, but um, let's go to the next. This is a piece um, I actually was commissioned in the uh, late 1980s uh, for Mary Mother Church Shrine at Lake of the Ozarks. The Fabic Caterpillar Tractor people commissioned this. This is a maquette of uh, a commission I got to depict Mother Mary. The depiction was really to try to do a universal statement about someone that is real and was real and walked on the earth. Not necessarily a statue, but I was trying to make something that was really alive, welcoming, alive, beautiful, graceful. This is a this this photograph is a, about this tall of the maquette. Okay, next we enlarged it in New York to a heroic size. This is 14 foot stainless steel, by the way, 316 L low carbon. It can actually outlast the pyramids, which we need some things that are going to last. Um, Wonderful time sculpting this in New York. We did it at Talix Foundry in New York. Okay. Uh, this was early 1990s, right before the great flood of 93, when the studio was inundated with 12 foot of water. This was Orlando, Florida, and I was commissioned to create a piece with Jack that I did this just to honor the Special Olympics. This is Eunice Kennedy Schreiber accepting my piece as she started the Special Olympics. Um, that's Jack and myself there next to it. Uh, she was wonderful. We went out to dinner that night, and it's really kind of fun and overwhelming when you're sitting next to people like this. She was sitting on my right, and, and uh, Sergeant Shriver was sitting on my left, and Maria was over here talking to one of the Olympians. And I looked at, <laughs> I looked at Eunice and said, have you seen my sculpture of Hemingway in your brother's library? <laughs> it came out of my mouth, and I thought, that's almost crazy. Then I looked at Sergeant Schreiber and talked a little bit about my brother in the Peace Corps. But then I looked at Maria and said, your husband Arnold unveiled my Bartholi sculpture in New York uh, two years ago. It's really kind of weird that art can actually give you language that you can talk to people like this. After I asked, I thought, how can that happen? It's really amazing. Okay, next. This is a piece I was commissioned uh, about 1991, uh, uh, somewhere in that area. Uh, Andreas Grunzig in Zurich, Switzerland, 1975, with his nurse, invented the first balloon for angioplasty. Spencer King and Emory University invited Andreas to come to the United States where they taught his procedure out of Emory. So my first cast is there at the Grunzig Cardiology Department at Emory. And, um, He's holding an inflation device in his balloon, and the commission was to hand the balloon to the world. That was the depiction of what we were trying to do. Another amazing moment, he was actually killed in a plane crash in 88 with his wife, and I, did, I was commissioned to do this afterwards. Okay. Uh, this is a friend's family, Mike Harris, E.M. Harris Construction. I did this for the family on the 10th anniversary of his passing. Uh, it's a bar relief. Uh, bronze on uh, uh, Carpathian Elm Burl. Okay. Then we had to do something for the 1992 presentation of Columbus. Um, it's interesting because uh, Gene Lyons, who helped through Michael Fagan, um, helped me do the Mel Fisher sculpture, also worked for NASA Geo. He was one of the chief archivists in Spain. And he actually was telling, talking to me about Columbus because I was commissioned to do this piece as a limited edition. And um, we don't have a picture there, but this is an early sketch, one of the earliest known ones that the archivists knew to, to identify the Jova sketch, what Columbus really looked like. There's a lot of mystical and, you know, 
interpretations out there of what he was, but from what the archivists say, this is the earliest known look of the man. So I tried to use this, but he also would not have been using the astrolab because the astrolab was about eight pounds. Mel Fisher sent me an astrolab from the 16th century that I made a mold over so we could copy it, so it's accurate. But actually, Columbus would have been using something like this. The uh, Gene Lyons taught me this, and we kind of made this from scrap. This quadrant would, would uh, be more of what Columbus would have used on shipboard. Now, I'm not an expert at this, I'm just passing on what I've learned. So we kind of made this so you'd line this up with the pole star and pinch it off for the latitude where you're at. This was a lot less in weight, so he could, he could hold this on a, a rocking ship and line it up easier than an astrolab. So, at that time, the White House was going to present to Spain uh, my piece. This was right about 1992, but unfortunately, uh, there was some press, unfortunately, on uh, indigenous people, obviously, here in our country. The White House backed down. So I think there was a saying that Mother Teresa would say, uh, don't wait for the leaders, do it yourself. This is in the UN with John Fabic. That's the crown prince, now the king of Spain. Uh, we, we had it presented with the, the Spanish ambassador and the Fabics, and Ed Newman is right, right behind me, uh, Mara Harris, my friend Mara, with the Crown Prince. Ed Newman was one of the debaters that, that, that did the, the lectures and the debates between Kennedy and Nixon after five more Edward Newman. What a, great, what a fun man. But this is the Crown Prince. Boy, he was tall. I mean, every time I looked at him, I saw his, his, the bow on his tie, and I thought, this guy's really big. Um, next. Another commission about 19, after, after the flood, I was recovering, and this was one of the commissions that I was commissioned here in St. Louis. This is at Regina Clary home, Kenrick Seminary. Again, what a wonderful mercy taught thought to serve each other. This is the eternal priesthood, where I used uh, photographs that, from, that I could gather on Pope John Paul's trips, and um, honoring Archbishop May, who's holding the chalice in the center. Okay. When we were in, in Spain, uh, the Fabics also commissioned me to sculpt a man named Jose Luis Martial. Uh, this was started in Spain, and it, it, was, an, it was a fun piece because measuring the guy in Madrid, and then he came to the studio to pose, but uh, it's in stainless steel. There's two casts, one in Gumbo, Missouri, and one in Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Enterprise rent a car. I was commissioned by uh, the Enterprise people to pick, this is a, a, a maquette bar relief of 40 years of uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And that's Jack and Andy Taylor with their, some of their wonderful rigs. This is hanging in the main headquarters over in, on Brentwood. Okay. Joe Fabic, another commission, what the, uh, Jerry Fabic commissioned me, there's his son. Joe, uh, and it's, I like to balance things. I don't like things to be heavy because to me it shows life. Another mercy thing. Let's talk about life. Um, Joe Fabic was, if you're familiar, was one of the four founders of Wings of Hope. Catherine Dinkins, John Fabic's sister, the family commissioned Catherine. When she started posing, she says, Don, why would anybody want this portrait of me? And I said, Catherine, she sat in the chair and she was elegant how she sat. I said, I guarantee you're going to look like royalty when this is done, how she carried herself. She was so proper and carried. Many people have said, have you... Did you sculpt the Quinn? <laughs> How she balances, this is fun. Okay. A piece in the mid 90s to celebrate 100 years of Missouri Baptist Medical Center. There's three panels. It started in 1895. Then it moved to Taylor Avenue. In the middle above the Taylor Avenue building is uh, uh, Ed Edwin Pils uh, Pillsbury. He, he actually uh, started uh, Century Electric and in 1904 World's Fair, he won the grand prize for starting the, inventing the induction motor. So this was Joyce and, Joyce's father. He, this is 1915 with, you could see the ambulance and the first, one of the first x-ray machines in 1926. So I took photographs that they had in their archives and actually translated that into an accurate historic scene 
of 100 years. Uh, and you can see anesthesia, the, tail, the, 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 the building, a tailored building is, is growing. Next slide. Uh, this is the mid from the 1930s to the 70s. Same thing. There's Joyce and, and Carol Pillsbury in the middle. Um, when Edwin passed, they took over the, 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 the hospital on the, the CEO uh, on the board. And then they're here moving to Ballas where they're breaking ground. Next. So history to me is always important. Um, I think Sister Anthony and Sister Bizarre would be happy that we recorded history like this because I'm taking it because it, to me it's important that uh, composition is, is how the shapes fit together, which is the sculptural, but it had to be accurate. So that's another piece. Look at the centerpiece. That's open heart surgery uh, in the 90s. Okay. In the mid, about 19... Uh, uh, 96, my friend Michael Fagan called me and said, Don, I know how you're going to sculpt Bob Hope, because when I was sculpting Gussie Bush, Father Reiner called me one day and said, Don, I got Bob and Dolores, and I want to bring them out to the studio to show them, because Dolores is, Dolores is talking about doing something on Bob. And um, I uh, said, okay, come. Well, Bob went to the golf course, Dolores came to the studio. We started talking about sculpting him. We didn't do anything until much later. Ten years later, when my friend Michael Fagan said, Don, I know what we need to do. We need to do sculpt, sculpt Bob Hope for the USO in Washington. So I started this piece life-size. The first cast went to Johnny Grant. Johnny was the uh, honorary mayor of Hollywood and started the Walk of Fame. If you, if you go out Hollywood Boulevard and see all those stars, Johnny got my sculpture for all his work helping entertain the troops. Okay. Uh, the Veterans Chapel in Los Angeles has one of the casts. This is the Bob Hope Veterans Chapel. It's Sepulveda in Wilshire, um, honoring Bob for everything he did to honor the men and women serving our great country. That, those pieces of that with the Department of Defense was amazing. All I can tell you was what some amazing times with hanging out in Los Angeles with people that were affiliated with Bob. Uh, I have some more stories on that. I could go on forever on this, but all I can say is, wow. <laughs> you know, the more, the more I've learned, too, through all this, meeting all these wonderful people, so many different levels of life, God made us all, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't think there's anybody on this planet that should be that impressed with themselves. Let's just all work together and help each other. Let's just do our job. Okay. I sculpted Buzz Westfall for a piece here in, in St. Louis and Clayton. Uh, obviously, you know, our county executive died with a terrible death, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, right before this piece, he called me about a year, year and a half earlier, before he passed, and we were going to start, uh, he wanted to get my ideas on uh, a fireman policeman memorial in Clayton. So, I'll never forget this. We were standing on this exact spot when I looked at Buzz and said, I can vision black granite with stainless steel on it, honoring the firemen and policemen. We didn't do the commission, but I had no idea at that time. Somehow I was being inspired to tell him about what I was doing for him. That's right on that spot. Next. The 2000s. Okay. Catholic Health Association commissioned me to create a piece, an award they used that they gave the hospitals around the country. This happened for quite a few years. We also did the medals. It's called the Catholic, uh, the Healing Christ Award. I actually brought one of the casts over there so you could see it. It's talking about service. And obviously the Sisters of Mercy are very much with service in helping each other and helping save humanity and this planet. This was a fun moment. <laughs> uh, Jerry Fabick, who's holding the sculpture, uh, Joe was very close friends with Jersey Kluger, who was a close friend of the Pope's. So the Mary Mother of the Church Shrine set up us presenting in the Vatican uh, to John Paul, the maquette of my Mother Mary sculpture. This was 2001 February, 
Um, that's Bishop Gatos, myself. And I'm staring. If you, you notice what I'm looking at? I'm kind of staring right at him. So what do you tell somebody like this, okay? I'm a sculptor. What can I say? <laughs> I uh, looked at him, and I thought to myself, when I was sculpting his bas-relief in 96 for Regina Clary, there's a part right here called the glabella, okay? And I was doing a three-quarter view of him, and I really had a hard time determining with photographs on the, how that was working. I looked at him and said, I caught your glabella. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right there. I know the Pope spoke a lot of languages, and I'm thinking, I hope he understood what I was saying. I wasn't trying to be insulting. I'm thinking, oh no. <laughs> Hit me with that ruler, sis. <laughs> um, Another amazing moment with this, at this time I was walking around the Vatican with then Bishop Dolan, who's now Cardinal Dolan, and Timmy was in charge of the North American College. We were walking around the Vatican, which is really pretty breathtaking just by itself, much less thinking about where they were going to put your piece of art. It's like, I'm not worthy! <laughs> I'm not worthy! <laughs> so we picked a couple spots. Well, I came back and I called uh, then Bishop Dolan a couple times after that, and no one seemed to know where the sculpture went. I have to say, after John Paul passed, uh, friends of mine started calling me and saying, Don, they showed the Pope's private residence and your sculpture's there. He took it to his room. Isn't that amazing? I'm just like flabbergasted. The power of art, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sister Carlita. Is anybody familiar with this man? He built Highway 40. He built Bush Stadium, the previous Bush Stadium with Gussie Bush. The ties on this was amazing. But I'll tell you what, at 102, that man could outdrink me on bourbon any day of the life. <laughs> he had ice and water as a chaser. I mean, <laughs> wow. I loved him. He was just amazing. What an amazing man. Whitney Harris. Whitney was the youngest trial attorney in Nuremberg, working under Jackson. Uh, Anna Harris commissioned me to do this. This is in the studio posing. The final piece is at Washington University in the law school. Uh, Whitney was amazing. What great stories he could say. But one of the most fun things, he's sitting in the same barber chair that I use for everybody. One of his favorite things was to come in the studio and watch the Dean Martin roast. <laughs> I have all those tapes. Oh, he'd laugh and laugh. I'd have to turn it off so I could get him to stop laughing, so I could just get him to pose for a minute. I loved Whitney. Back in the 80s, when they wanted to put my sculpture in space, I knew in 1984-85 they weren't going to shoot a 30-pound bronze into space. So I started experimenting with other ideas. Okay, So in 2000, uh, I met with Eric Lindbergh, grandson, around the year 2001, preparing for the 75th anniversary, and I said, Eric, I think I should sculpt bas-reliefs of your grandfather off my original piece, and next slide the Spirit of St. Louis. Again, I loved aviation, but again, as an artist, I just like to record history. So I consider all these different things portraits. It, this is a portrait of the Spirit of St. Louis. And we've used it through so many things with the Lindberghs to honor people all around the world to celebrate what is this all about, you know. When he did that flight, he united uh, the world. He made it possible for people to believe in themselves and what's going on with that. And, and much less, it's from St. Louis, the name. I just love it with the founders and the supporters. There's so many stories on all this I could talk about again, too. But of course, we had to do something with Stan. Stan came out many times to the studio, and I finally just did a bar relief of him for Covenant House. This is one I wanted to do to support his efforts. We created the medals for Stan that are only used for uh, his love of baseball and children. Many of the pieces I've created can't be bought, they can only be earned. All the derivatives of my work, like you're about to see with the medals, uh, we use them all over the world to honor people for, for the subject of what they stood for. And they can't be bought because we all know, ladies and gentlemen, Life is a gift from God. We can't buy it, no matter how much money we think we have. And that's why I'm so proud of the work we've been able to do, not by myself, but with so many people helping me. Again, T. 
teamwork and partnership. I feel like I'm just the, the symphony director that's maybe lucky enough to wave the wand with all these amazing, talented people. So I'd like to introduce Karen Wellens, our chief mold maker at the studio. Just, just stand up a second. I wish I had more. I wish I had more of my most talented artists and partners that have worked on all these pieces because it's not just about me, ladies and gentlemen. It's all of us. Lindbergh even wrote about we. He recognized that, that it wasn't just him. He had the idea, but it took everybody else to get him there. The sponsors in St. Louis, Donald Hall, the designer in uh, San Diego that built the plane. Stan was a great guy, wasn't he? I really wanted to sculpt him because of baseball, but really because of his attitude on what he really believed and what he felt. He was just a good guy. He really wanted to help people and he loved kids. Another big subject. In 2003, I was asked to create a monument honoring life. Donation of life tissue and organ donation. This is down where the Chuckadome used to sit. I still upset they tore that down, the old barn, but my piece now sits on center ice. For a sculptor, and I, as again, I say, life is such a gift from God. I'm honored that I could actually be working on these pieces and the good Lord using me to, to depict how important it is to give life. So I took this photograph in the World's Fair Pavilion April of 2004. These are two double lung recipients with donor families toasting life together. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a very moving piece. We're really honoring the really understanding of what it is giving. Sisters of Mercy again. We're currently working on a piece that's going actually in Cape Girardeau. We're unveiling in two weeks. This is a, another uh, part of it that we unveiled at Jonesboro, Arkansas, a derivative of it, because it's such a universal statement about what is that. It's a worldwide statement. Uh, we made the Gift of Life medals, which you'll see a little bit later. These go to the donor families. And we're actually, uh, I redu we re-sculpted the hand of the woman, the large lady. Um, so I was being interviewed in the studio when we were actually sculpting the clays, and I had this particular piece up in the studio, and I was being interviewed that day, oh, this was about 2005, by Sue Wallace, and she looked up and saw this photograph of this woman above the board, and she looked at me and said, and I didn't know these people, I just took the photo. She looked at me and said, what's the photograph of my mother-in-law doing up on your board? I said, whoa. <laughs> She said, that's Betty Wallace. And I go, wow. Betty introduced me to Debbie Radcliffe. It really becomes real, doesn't it? it, it there's wonderful stories about that because when we unveiled the piece, um, we had the dedication and there were some people that came in from the West Coast. And uh, forgive me, I can't remember the, all the names right now, but this grandmother uh, was the grandmother of the daughter who was killed, that was about 20, who gave the lungs to this woman. She came to the studio and touched the clay and said, my daughter lives on. I mean, powerful stuff here. Um, I'm just proud that we could be somehow part of all this, and our team is all part of it. And sister, again, what you, what you taught us, and all your sisters of mercy on, you really did affect this work. I hope you see your missions in all this. Okay. A close-up of the piece. We're using the little boy all the way on the right. That's him right here. I mean, I was going for accuracy on a moment. We're using this um, for the other pieces in Jonesboro and the one we're unveiling in Cape Girardeau next week, in two weeks. Uh, it's kind of a universal statement. And that was my idea, that pieces of this will be scattered and used all over the central Midwest, which again is symbolic of all of us in the thread of life. The 
Mahoney brothers, uh, University of Massachusetts, Dick Mahoney commissioned me to do quite a few pieces. He was uh, president of Monsanto Chemical Company, if you're familiar. He's the gentleman in the middle. He commissioned for this for the, uh, the Integrated Science Building in UMass. Um, it floats off the wall. He and his three brothers. Uh, Dick commissioned a lot of my pieces, too. Go ahead. Here we are. The Hopes fell in love with my piece for the USO, and they kind of called it his legacy piece. Um, we first created the Spirit of Hope medals, which is the award in the Pentagon that's handed out that we included the Coast Guard. This is the only inter-service award in the United States that includes the Coast Guard. It came from Michael Fagan, Don Wiegand, and our foundation. Isn't that fun? Matter of fact, we had events in the Pentagon, and I annoyed the Secretary of the Navy because we let the Coast Guard in. <laughs> had a great story on that, but I won't go into it. <laughs> they didn't like me. <laughs> but this is a one-pound medal, and when um, the first ones were handed out, General Casey, I love it, he was Chief of Staff of the Army when we first started doing this, he, he looked, at the pay, looked at the winner, when there's, there are six of these handed out every year in the Pentagon, or the, their version now, not mine, but this is the original. He looked at the person and said, brace yourself, this is heavy. <laughs> he put this over their head, he, this is Chief of Staff of the Army, okay? I love it. Um, but can I ask you to assist me for a minute? Karen, come on up. Yeah, I, I need you to help me. Yeah, come on up. Assist. Assist. Okay. I get to assist. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember when I was talking earlier about uh, holding up the things that I wanted to enlarge mm -hmm. when I was four? This is how we made this piece, and this is how I've made all of my heroic sculptures. There's a traditional way that I'm going to show you in a minute about enlarging sculpture, but... I wanted to show you something. Sister Lee just introduced me to Brother Mel on his work. And I'm actually following a technique here that Michelangelo used in the Sistine Chapel. Now, there's lots of ways of enlarging sculpture. This is just my way. I thought of it when I was four. Enlarge a photograph, but I like the energy the photograph translates into my work. It's almost like if I can't have him sitting there, I want everything I can around me to generate the energy to sculpt this man. When Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel, he laid out the parchment, drew out the sketches, and it's fresco work. Brother Mel, Sister Lee just showed me. Then he put the, the parchment against the plaster, but they made little holes along the lines, and when you put it in place, you dust it with charcoal. Take the paper down, and it didn't leave a hole. It left the line where they could translate. And remember, he was on scaffolding, what, a couple feet away. You couldn't get back and look at the work. This is what I do. I take this and translate this into the clay. It makes a mark similar to what Michael did with the black charcoal. So we, you could, when you look at this lady, you can see oh, there's a lot of holes in here. I don't know if he was really holy, but you know, he, I made a lot of holes. <laughs> Bad joke, you know. Uh, okay, let me, let me put this down. Okay. So, thank you, ladies. So, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to enlarge traditionally. These are a little bit more traditional ways, okay? Um, how about a volunteer? Come on up here, young man. I only drew blood one time on this. Oh, great. These are considered enlarging tools, okay? This was Reno Gastaldi's. This is an old one from Italy, about 100 years old. Okay, this is a technique where you set the calibrations and uh, he would enlarge or reduce. So for instance, when you're starting a portrait of the round, one of the first things I do is check a measurement called the brow to chin, because it starts to tell me the scale, okay? So I'm gonna come in here, don't breathe, <laughs> and I'm going to take that measurement right here, okay? And if you start to look over here, you're gonna see this is set for about two and a half times larger. If I was gonna reduce it, I'd go the other way. 
I come in like this, and this is two and a half times smaller. This is built so that you could obviously go around and measure like the canthus, the tragus, and the different points three-dimensionally. This is a more modern version. But I love this one. <laughs> I love the energy with this one. By the way, I, I also use this out in the yard for picking up trash. It's kind of... <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There's a lot of different techniques on enlarging, but that's Donald's way that I figured out as a kid. I thought it's kind of fun because we've all my heroics have done this way. Winston Churchill, Argon of Tissue, all of them. Great stories with this thing right here. <laughs> Where is I, that? uh, that's in Burbank, Los Angeles, the Bob Hope Airport, and it's this, it's this scale. This is the original. Um, let me think if I'm forgetting anything else here. Okay, I did a couple other pieces for the Hopes that we're going to use for the Emmys, but we never used it. After 9-11, they, they stopped the Emmys for a year, and the Hopes were asking me to do something that they wanted to give to Oprah, but it never happened. Uh, this was a design I did, which was different than the USO. Uh, Skip to the next one. This is the reverse. We still haven't decided exactly what we're using with this, but jumping into the next one. This is fun. This is the same piece, but I did a different version of it. This is Bob Hope's office in Los Angeles, and I'm in the front part of the office, and there were two ladies in the back, because I was taking photographs of this, because I didn't really have any good photos, so I'm up there taking some shots. And there were two ladies in the back that uh, waved at me. One was Annette. Uh, Bob's secretary, one of, one of his assistants, and the other woman, I, I kind of recognized her, but I wasn't sure who it was. I mean, you're in, in Bob's house, so you never know who's going to be there. Uh, so they walked up, and this lady who was with Annette started looking at the piece and said, my God, it's so good, Don. You really must have known him. I never met Bob, and I met his whole family. He would never wanted to sit for me, so he was always avoiding me. I did this from photographs and movies. So I looked at this woman and said, I just did it from the movies, which we all watched. All the road shows, all the films. I was just using what any one of us saw. And Annette looks at me and said, Oh, Don, I didn't know you knew Mrs. Crosby. <laughs> That's who was asking me the questions. She said, Can we do something on my husband? I go, Sure. <laughs> that was really fun. Okay. The Iron Curtain speech, 1946, when President Truman bought Winston Churchill here at the request of the college in Westminster. Depicting the Iron Curtain speech, we sculpted uh, Churchill. It's heroic size. It's right at the Church National Churchill Museum. Um, we did, we always do maquettes. When you're starting a sculpture, you always start doing models. So these are some of the early models that I started, just to start on scale and ideas to, to show the client. Um, this, is, this is a maquette of the earlier piece, the Regina Clary piece you saw at Kenrick. Uh, they're just compositional ideas to get started. Okay, This is a maquette of the, of the Organ of Tissue Donation Monument. It's just a rough start. Um, the Churchill piece, we actually used, got original microphones from the uh, Milwaukee Museum so we could authenticate it correctly. So I, we sculpted the, the microphones. Karen was working on it, pack all of us. Um, but one of the interesting things with the speech, and I don't have the photograph to show you, when Churchill actually did that speech, there was this vine that was wrapping around the stage in, in Westminster. And in 1946, it was called, it was the, the tame, not name of this particular uh, vine was a Purple Heart, commonly known as Wandering Jew. Isn't that really amazing that that was on that podium stage? So what we did is we took six different versions abstractly of the leaves, and we produced 250 of the leaves on the bronze. Let's do the next. <clears throat> okay. This talks about the scale of the piece, just an idea, okay? This is in the studio where we'd had it hanging. We were patinating it at this point and preparing it and getting it ready for final delivery. Uh, but it starts talking about 
This gets the size of it. Because when pieces are put outside, they're really dwarfed compared to inside. It's just scale. Okay. Ann Lindbergh. I had to honor Mrs. Lindbergh. So we had an event in, in uh, Hollywood for the, 70, for the anniversary of um, <clears throat> Charles's flight, the 75th anniversary, which was one of the events. And they presented, the, the Lindbergh presented the first cast of this to Sally Ride, the first woman in space. And um, also they gave Harrison Ford and uh, Jim Fowler my Lindbergh bar reliefs that you saw earlier, which was very fun, uh, talking to Indy. <laughs> Okay, next. This is Anusha Ansari. She is the first Muslim female scientist in space, and she got the third cast. These were not sold. They were only pieces I did through our foundation to honor these people. And sometimes I have to pray a lot that I can figure out how I can pay for all these things, but you know, the important thing is we're doing it. We're not waiting. Okay. Tennessee Williams, <clears throat> Tennessee Williams Foundation for the Arts, the family has commissioned me to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's a famous photograph of him standing there, yes, with a cigarette. <laughs> um, this, we don't really have a place for this yet. We're creating the heroic one right now. This is just the maquette that Fran Williams commissioned me to do, the niece of Tennessee. We're, we're, these are all current projects, okay? Uh, Murray Wiedenbaum is at Washington University. If you're familiar with Murray, he was a great uh, economist that taught, helped quite a few presidential runs. Uh, this is the Washington Bridge City Reading Box. Okay. Prescott Bush, this is the Wounded Warrior Foundation of Bethesda, Maryland. Prescott, uh, father of George Age and father of George W. He was really a major factor in raising money in World War II for the other. That's a portrait in the ground, and that's, uh, like I said, the Walter Reed. He was so convincing. Okay. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, this was fun. This is amazing. <coughs> I first started getting interested in sculpting Pope Francis uh, my, right after he was looking at the market of the country. Bishop Parsons started working with me on trying to come up with something. But we didn't do anything here. It was going to be the same as the cathedral. But then, um, right after we did a bunch of designs, Pontifical, Aca Pontifical Academy of Science is a gall gathering in Rome. It started in the 16th century. The, one of the first people, the first president that became associated with that was Galileo. Even though they rejected him for 75 years, they still claimed he was the first founder of it. But it's gathering, and it's not a Catholic organization, it's just scientists gathering under the umbrella in Rome to talk about facts of preserving the planet and preserving life and what, what relates to it in all, in all forms. Um, so Dr. Peter Raven, our friend uh, Dr. Raven, was appointed by John Paul in 1990. And um, he's one of the 80 life members. So he goes there and brings his findings on his wonderful studies out of the botanical garden here. And in 2016, his wife Pat took this photo of the Pope listening to Peter talk in the pious, in the Vatican itself. Here we have the piece that I interpreted, okay? Uh, it's bronze on, on uh, walnut and Carpathian elm. Um, I thought what I'd do is show you a couple things here for a second, which is kind of fun. And bear with us, we're getting through this pretty soon. Uh, the Cardinal sent me a number of pieces to work from, so they sent me a duplicate of his cross. And I had to re-sculpt it to, to fit the view on three-quarter, okay? And you're all welcome to come up and, you know, touch them and play with these things if you want. But this is my sculpture of the piece that actually hangs right there. It's a duplicate of that piece you see right there, okay? Um, but I thought real quick what I'd do is show you, <laughs> traveling with sculpture is an interesting thing. You know, going through these airports for security, and I decided on this, I'm not shipping this, we're carrying this. So I had a sculpture in one case, and I always carry my easels and everything, lights, I take everything with me. 
because I, no matter where we went, I'd always say, do you have heavy easels? No, they don't. <laughs> Not to hold a 100-pound sculpture or whatever. Okay. So, picture this. Traveling through the airport, <laughs> carrying my lights and easels in a gun case. <laughs> I'm very thankful they were that close watching, you know, I mean, really, they're protecting us. But boy, did we get stopped. I always carried photographs that I could sign of what I was sculpting to hand out to everybody and sign them. Thank you for doing your job. <laughs> so if, if, you, if you look at some of the photographs, you'll see of the room where we unveiled the piece and presented it to the, to, uh, the Pope. This is right next to his, his chair. They're very trusting, <laughs> but I have to show you one thing. <clears throat> it's hard to find a good easel that's portable, that can hold heavy weight. So I've carried this thing to a lot of locations around the world, okay? And I always carry my mom's cloth that she made for me, my unveiling cloth. Look at kids, because she made so many of these for me. She even, <laughs> let me find it. She always made sure I'd bring them back. Remember how your mom would, maybe it didn't happen with you guys, would sew your name on your underwear? <laughs> I love it. This was given to me in Los Angeles, which I thought was kind of appropriate, okay? I'll show you this. Now picture this. The Pope's, the Pope's chair is right here. I'm doing all this right here, okay? <clears throat> There's a lot of guards standing around, too. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, I think that's going to fit. Okay. I draped it. Actually, this is not the drape I did put on the easel, but this is the drape I did cover the sculpture with, okay? So I always like to drape it. The one I actually covered this with was, was longer. <clears throat> this, excuse me, this is not the actual piece, but this is a G. Clay print of the piece. So I thought I'd bring it and put it on the easel. The sculpture was on here, uh, which you'll see in just a moment. And the Pope walked past it, and he kind of looked at it at the corner of his eye, and he was having a problem walking. He wasn't using a walker, but he was kind of slow. He sat down and looked back at it. Okay? <clears throat> a fun story about this easel. My friend Barney McNulty, who I met out in Los Angeles and through Michael and through the USO, in 1949 with Ed Wynn, he was at the page at ABC. And Ed Wynn was on live television, Okay? Edwin was taking some cold medicine and looked at Barney and said, Barney, uh, Mr. Young Man, can you take something and write my lines on this so I, and hold it up so I could read it? Barney invented the first cue card. This is one of Barney's easels that he took on tour with Bob Hope. The, the family gave it to me. So I took Hope to the Pope. <laughs> Okay. He liked it. Um, look at the cross. Oh, by the way, back, that's Cardinal Turkson, everyone, who's friends with the, very much friends with the Sisters of Mercy, right there, the Cardinal. He reached out to me, grabbed my hands, and I know you've probably heard this before, but he said, Don, you made me look like I'm thinking. <laughs> my sir, I wouldn't want your job. Can I say a prayer for you? <laughs> okay. This is the Pius IV building where all the Academians meet. 16th century building in the Vatican where my piece hangs now. It's an honor, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's, I know that's going to be there a long time. And that's all I could say is it's humbling. Um, I'm proud that we could actually make something like this happen. And how did it happen? <laughs> I guess the good Lord want me to do this because I don't know other than that. Okay. So I talked a few minutes about the Wiegand Foundation. Um, 
We started this in 2004 to carry on the mission of what I've started here with all my staff and so many people, my mom and dad. The studio's never been rented, but we raised millions of dollars for nonprofit there because they come and gather. And all my work, the derivatives are not for sale. What I mean by that is, let's do the next. Where art serves the world, that's a term we came up with because we're using art to support people that are making a difference in saving this planet, saving life, and doing something for somebody else. And they can't, certain pieces here, all the metals, they can't buy them, they can only earn them. That's been an interesting challenge along the way, but I think that's what we have to do with life. We can't buy our life, it's such a gift. And, it's, and when it's time that the good Lord takes it away, it's what happens, you know, it doesn't matter how much money we have. Next. The Bartholi medal we did capturing my piece in Comar, France. Um, it's one of the liberty pieces. We've used it around the world to honor people that are supporting liberty. I actually gave one on the 60th anniversary of the ending of World War, of World War II in Japan. The emperor of Japan was presented one of my medals. And the empress wears my gifts from the seat pen too, by the way, which is very amazing. Okay, nice. The Spirit of Hope Award was created, as we said, a reduction of my piece on Bob to honor the men and women serving. There's six of these handed out in the Pentagon every year. The Pentagon is doing their own version right now with my image on it. This is the original one. Um, I'm very proud to say that, this is, again, this is the only uh, award in the United, Inter Service Award in the United States where they honor the Coast Guard too in the Pentagon. That came from St. Louis, Mercy High School thought. <laughs> really, think about that. I, I do all the time. Next, please. <clears throat> oh, that medal, the, the, the Spirit of Hope medal. I, <laughs> the Secretary of Defense hands one out every year. And I met Gary Sinise before he got it, so I showed Gary his medal. The Pentagon didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like the fact that I showed Gary the medal before the Secretary of Defense. So, sister, get out that yardstick and slap me. <laughs> I said, it does have something to do with ownership and authorship, and by the way, we gave this to you. But I was respectful. <laughs> Gary liked it. Okay, Cliff Robertson, the Ethics Award. Cliff posed for me. This is a piece we did to honor Cliff because of everything he did to stand against a lot of the Hollywood moguls that were taking hand handouts. Next. Des and Mary Ann Lee, major St. Louis benefactors. Um, this is the Missouri University Medal for uh, Philanthropy. Next. Earl and Myrtle Walker. Earl was definitely a, an entrepreneur, but very generous. He, he built the, the, uh, the Maryville, uh, the, the building for, for nursing. That's where our piece stands. So this is used by uh, Maryville for a special award. Next. Anniversary, we had the event with the Lindberghs at the studio in 2005. The Sisters of Mercy came with the Lindberghs and read the book. I had the medal here, but I thought I'd show you again. When we get started on a project, you, always, you have to have designs, okay? So these are all the designs that I did. First, to show Reeve Lindbergh and the Lindbergh family my concept of how the shells should fit together. I let them pick it, pick the one they wanted, and then I translated it into the final sketch, which is here. It's all in the process. I wonder where I learned that. <laughs> I told you I embarrass you. They deserve so much credit. Okay. The Healing Christ Award for National Catholic Health, it's a reduction of that piece over there. It was used for years to honor people again in the health industry around the country. Okay. The Lindbergh Award. I did this reducing my two bar reliefs, the two that actually went into space. So when Bert Rattan's craft went up, 2004, 
Alan Shepard's idea went to fruition. They sent my two bar reliefs into space on Bert's craft, that's low orbit, 62 miles. So I actually had the first bar release in space. So they're also in the Smithsonian. But this goes, to the, the Air and Space Muses, Museum uses this. Also the Lindbergh Foundation to honor people. And they're not sold, they can only be earned, again. The Tingmer Sartog is an interesting plane that Charles and Ann took off from the east coast of America in 1931 on a pleasure craft, on a pleasure uh, Lockheed Sirius plane, and a direct route between the east coast of America and Japan is a straight line over Alaska. So as they were flying, they noticed how man was affecting the planet because Ann flew the plane more than Charles. Actually, she invented the sliding cockpit and the ladder to get in out of the plane which they used the sliding cockpit on the, the World War II aircraft. That was Ann Lindbergh. Charles was taking photographs. She didn't get enough credit, so we did this piece to honor her. Both of them, but of course her. I'm proud to say we used this a couple times around the world, again, with the great mission of mercy. Uh, when they were flying drones in North Africa, this one year, the Lindberghs, it was about 10 years ago when drones were first came out, there was a group in North Africa that were flying drones to catch the poachers that were killing the African elephant and the black rhino. Guess what they got as a thank you? Okay, next. The gift of life, of course, we can't say enough about passing on the gift of life. The medal is here. Next. The Murray Wiedenbaum Medal for Washington University. This has been used a lot with the school, still is, uh, honoring people that are uh, studying and passing on the words of economics. Pope John Paul, we did two medals for one, the first one for his tour, Pope John Paul and the Jewish people, which was sanctioned by the Pope, and then Bless the Children is this one. Um, amazing, the whole thing is just amazing. Okay, of course the Stan Muschel Medal, and this is honoring um, baseball and uh, children. Matter of fact, the Cardinals presented when Jerry Jeter retired, and he was on the field at the stadium a few years ago. The Cardinals gave uh, Jeter my cufflink set of Stan as a thank you. Okay. Life casting. Did we jump? Did we miss one? I'll go back a little bit, I think. Okay, go ahead. So this is life casting. I started doing this with Gussie Bush, I told you earlier. The techniques have improved. So I'm just showing you a couple casts we did. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Crown Candy Kitchen. This technique goes back almost 10,000 years where you're actually making a mold over the body. I just love the hands. You can actually lift the fingerprint off these. This would be considered a three-dimensional photograph and exactation versus one of our pieces, which are interpretations. These are my interpretations of those. This is making a mold and stopping a moment of life. Again, honoring life. We don't sell this. I do this around the world with Karen and my staff to honor people that are making a difference, especially landmarks in St. Louis. Okay, we had to do Bob Cuban on the drums. The Inn Men, I love Bob, go ahead. Chuck Berry, this is a valuable piece. It's the Blueberry Hill, if you ever walk in Blueberry Hill, Chuck came, he had huge, hand, huge hands, but you know, right there, it's recording history. Next. Edwina Sands actually came and helped me work on her grandfather's piece when we were sculpting Churchill. I really like when I'm depicting someone that family members or someone involved with it will come and actually touch the clay because I want them to participate. Okay. <laughs> the concrete. <laughs> we had to talk about Ted. What a great guy. He and Dottie are great people. Okay. My friend Loretta, Loretta Swit. I told Loretta, I need to cast your lips. She came to the studio and brought her compact. <laughs> so we cast her hands. She has it out in Los Angeles with her Emmys. She's a riot. Great stories there. Okay. Of course, this was a fun moment in Kenny Bunkport. The Walker family helped me set this up when we went and cast George and Barbara in their home. What an amazing moment, my God. Mrs. Bush is a riot. She never, she never got over 
the fact that I've stuffed a pillow behind her back and it made, it, made her look porky. Oh. Said, Don, don't show anybody that photo. <laughs> she really was an elegant lady and what an amazing woman. And if you look at the piece, she's holding him up. I love that. It really tells a lot about the whole thing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I knew you were in for an interesting afternoon. Was it interesting? Yes, yes. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, Don, for leading us on an inspiring and entertaining journey through your life as a sculptor. Thank you for adding such beauty to our public and private spaces. Thank you for the recognition that the Wigan Foundation offers to those who have made significant accomplishments in science, technology, national defense, and human service. We wish you every grace and good thing, our mercy friend, as you continue your journey and mission to serve the world through art. And thanks to you, our audience, for joining us this afternoon and contributing to our mission through your attendance at this event. Again, if you would like to know more about MCRC, there are flyers on your table with our contact information and website. Leslie's outside at the registration desk. She has a constant contact sign-up sheet if you'd be interested in receiving uh, notifications about our retreats and conferences and workshops. You can sign up for that. We don't share your information with any other entity, so if you'd like to be on the contact list, please feel free. If you'd like to support our mission financially, there are donor envelopes on the tables. We also accept donations on our website under the support our mission button. How's that for clever? And if you are welcome to call, and you're welcome to call or email me if you want further information about how you can support our efforts. So I bid you goodbye. Have a safe trip home. Please watch out for the wildlife on our grounds and driveway. In addition to being a retreat and conference center, we're also a certified wildlife habitat. The Canada geese are currently on their annual visit and they act just like they own the place, which they do. So they are rather demanding and we just humor them. Thank you so much for coming. We hope to see you again. <laughs>